So I, I was invited today to speak a little bit about the future of natural gas in Mexico. I think um, over the last 15 or 20 years, there has been an assumption that Mexico can just rely on cheap natural gas from the U.S. to be able to, to fund and stimulate growth, especially in the northern part of the country. Um, but what we've been talking about a lot over the last couple of years, particularly during COVID, is the importance of having uh, a just and, and equitable energy transition. And we believe that natural gas plays a very important role in the future of Mexico. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, so first and foremost, who are we? Uh, Jaguar is a group of 200 people uh, living and working in Mexico, uh, proudly a part of something that's uh, trying to do things positively, trying to find ways to be able to develop our natural resources and have a positive impact across the whole value chain through society and, and for our people or set themselves. We are an operator that's 100% Mexican. Uh, we're the largest operator in, on land in Mexico after Pemex. Uh, and we're working very hard to have a positive impact in the environment, to society, and with social impact, and also human development. We believe very passionately that we need to live and breathe these things internally to be able to express them properly externally. So we work very, very, very hard to be viewed as being a responsible operator. We have a large portfolio spread across three states in Mexico, uh, Tamaulipas, Veracruz, and Tabasco. Uh, we're operating in four different uh, sedimentary basins, the Burgos, Tampico Masantli, Veracruz, and the Southeast. Um, we hold a little bit over 3,000 square kilometers uh, in total surface area, which is a large acreage position. We are producing uh, today a, a limited amount of gas and, and oil that's starting to grow. Um, we received all of these blocks in the bid rounds that were associated with exploration. And as a result, our focus has really been on exploration, but we've now discovered enough gas and been able to reactivate some legacy fields from Pemex and we now expect the production to grow very substantially going forward. Our acreage position, uh, there's something on the order of 8% of the surface area of Mexico that is in private hands, the, the balance is with Pemex, of which on land we hold just about 50%. Uh, our acreage position is very similar to a lot of the offshore operators. Um, we are the only operator that's focused on material natural gas. Uh, most of the rest of the land operators are focused on oil, and the majority of the activity that's going on offshore today is focused on oil as well. We believe that you have to do things right from the beginning, and that in order for us to be successful, it's not about production, it's not about profit, it's about having a positive impact. It's making the communities where we live, the environment where we operate better for us being there. Um, and the way that we're doing that is through a sustainability strategy that touches on four key pillars, uh, trying to have a positive impact on our environment, in our social communities, creating value for society. Some of this is paying taxes and, and generating profit, but a lot of it is about generating value through the whole value chain, making sure that we're working with local suppliers to, to develop the skills that we need to be able to be successful and making sure as much of the value that we are creating with the natural resource wealth that exists in Mexico is able to stay in Mexico. And then finally, human development. This is about finding opportunities to be able to create value through education, through training, um, through uh, industry outreach programs where we look to communities, where we look to people to be able to have them continue to develop. And this is things that we live and breathe internally. Almost all of our social programs and environmental programs are funded by our employees. Uh, there, our employees are very actively involved. And as a, as a simple example, all of our employees have personal development objectives, which can be something as simple as improving their English language skills to give them better access to development opportunities, or as advanced as people taking doctorate programs that are being funded um, through scholarships from Jaguar. And we have a very integral uh, approach to our sustainability strategy. We are, we are trying to touch as many of the key uh, UN development goals that make sense for a company like us, and particularly focused on the idea of providing cost-effective clean energy to everybody. And that's really what we're going to talk about, the potential that natural gas has in order to make sure that the development that Mexico is going to be able to undergo over the next 10, 20, and 30 years is equitable. This is not just about making sure that we reduce environmental impact. It's about making sure that everybody is part of a positive energy transition going forward. Why is this important? Mexico is a large country with a very large economy, and notably for us, the ninth largest consumer of natural gas in the world. So we're a very large consumer of natural gas. 
But sadly, Mexico lags in key things like the Environmental Performance Index and Social Performance Index. Companies like Jaguar can play a key role in helping the government improve the situation, make sure that the environmental and social progress is on the same order of the importance of the Mexican economy. So why do we believe there's a bright future for natural gas in Mexico? Well, I think everybody uh, came to realize in February the importance of natural gas to Mexico. This is something that's probably been uh, not as understood as it should be. Uh, the interdependence that we have with the U.S. production of natural gas, particularly Texas, was clearly not understood. And with a historic cold snap that occurred at the beginning of February this year, there was something on the order of 40 million Mexicans that went without power for a period of a number of days. It had a huge impact on industry, but more importantly, people didn't have heat in their houses. Uh, there were a number of deaths in Mexico, a number of deaths in the southern U.S. Uh, and this highlighted the, the fragility of the situation for Mexico because as soon as the situation started to affect Texas, the first reaction to Texas was to shut off the valves to Mexico and make sure that as much gas as was available was being provided to, uh, to provide heat and energy in Texas. We are highly exposed to the U.S. market. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's allowed Mexico to grow uh, with access to cost-effective gas, particularly the northern industrial regions in the country. But it is a risk, and it's something that we need to be, I think everybody is much more conscious about now. What does this really mean? If you look at the production of natural gas and the import that we're, that we're currently undertaking, there's something on the order of $6.7 billion that is lost to the Mexican economy. This is a direct loss. This is the difference between consumers buying gas from Mexican producers and having something on the order of 97 or 98 cents on the dollar stay in the Mexican economy versus buying the gas from the US and having over 90 cents on the dollar leave Mexico. The real problem isn't just the $6.7 billion, it's the trickle-down effect. If a local producer was producing this gas, they would be paying their employees, paying their suppliers, and that $6.7 billion would actually have a multiplying effect on the Mexican economy. If you look at the consumption of natural gas going forward, there is an expectation that the demand in Mexico is going to continue to grow, but most of that demand is going to be filled by, by imports. Even though there is a projection of increased production domestically, um, based on the CNH's projection, most of the growth in demand in Mexico is going to be filled by importing gas from the U.S. Part of the reason is for this. The, if you look at the infrastructure maps in the U.S., the coverage of natural gas pipelines is extraordinary. There's 4.2 million kilometers of pipelines, gas pipelines in the U.S. We have something around 11,300 kilometers of pipelines in Mexico. That figure is actually very close to the amount of gas pipelines that exist in the water in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's been, we've been underinvested in terms of gas infrastructure, and as a result, we have limited pockets of opportunity where cost-effective gas can be supplied uh, into Mexican communities. This is particularly true in the southern part of the country, which has really restrictive gas access. Um, most of the gas is being consumed in the industrial hubs around Monterrey, some of it makes it down to the center of the country and into Guadalajara. But really, this is a case where the northern part of the country has an advantage because of its access to the cheap gas from the U.S. Why has this happened? Um, some people think that gas isn't a good business for Mexico. We, we believe passionately that that's not the case. If you look at the history of production in Mexico, in, in between 2005 and 2010, you had a fundamental change in the gas price. There was a, a, an increase in availability of, of gas in the U.S. The gas price started to crash. This coincides with the period where Pemex's finances started to become challenged. They had to make decisions where to invest. And somewhat logically, they decided to invest in oil projects and invest particularly in shallow water oil projects. And as a result, the production, which was growing in Mexico, particularly from the Burgos Basin, which is a green line there, um, started to plateau and then started to decline very rapidly. This is directly due to a lack of investment. This has nothing to do with the geological potential in the country. Um, and as a result, the very large demand increases that were occurring at the same period of time were being backfilled with imports. And we have a situation where Pemex had historically, or sorry, Mexico historically had been a net exporter of natural gas, and it was a source of income uh, into the country to becoming a net import, a substantial net import of natural gas. This is entirely a function of a decision made to stop investing in natural gas. If we look at the geological potential, there's a lot of different proxies that we can look at, but probably the best one is to look at the comparison of South Texas and the Burgos Basin. 
Um, the geology doesn't stop at the border. The subsurface is identical in the Mexican and Texas side of the border. Uh, it's been proven that there is even continuity of reservoirs that span the border. If you look at the potential gas reserves that are identified, um, there's five times more reserves that are identified in South Texas than Burgos. But why is that? The reason is because the well density is lower. There are 13 times more wells drilled in, in every thousand square kilometers on the Texas side of the border relative to the Burgos. If we look at the commercial feasibility of getting that gas to market, you're talking about 15 times more pipelines, you're talking about 10 times more gas processing plants, and you're talking about something on the order of eight or nine times more gas processing capacity. So the infrastructure's there, that means the investment has come, and the result is that you have one of the richest gas producing regions in the entire United States is the South Texas areas that have exactly the same geology as we're dealing with in Mexico. So what we have is a situation where natural gas in Mexico has been underexplored. It hasn't been a source of active operation for exploration or development since uh, the 1990s. There is huge development potential today. There's a lot of opportunities that we have today that are just basically going out and drilling wells on reservoirs that are well characterized in areas where the infrastructure is there. And that leaves aside, leaves aside the massive exploration potential in areas that have been underexplored in the Veracruz, Tampico, and Sapo basins in particular. But most importantly, this is an absolute key to a sustainable and equity, equitable energy transition. If we think about where we are today and where we are with respect to renewable energy, what proportion of our energy is being produced from renewable sources in Mexico, you're talking about something on the order of 15% of the electricity is being produced from renewable sources, but only 2% of total energy consumption in Mexico comes from renewable sources. If you look at all of the energy that we consume in our lives from transport, heat, power, electricity, et cetera. So the, at the end of the day, we need something to be able to bridge the gap. And natural gas is the most cost-effective and the least contaminating option that currently exists. Leaving aside the huge value that natural gas will continue to have for a very long period of time uh, as a source of primary heat and in industrial processes and as a key feedstock for petrochemicals which we currently don't have any renewable solution to be able to replace. So what are we doing, that, doing about this at Jaguar? Why are we focused on natural gas? Why are we so passionate about this? Well, if you look at it from a private sector perspective, we're seeing that private producers are starting to have an increasingly important share in the natural gas uh, field. Roughly 12% of production today is coming from private operators, which is the good news. Uh, we're starting to backfill some of the the lack of investment that Pemex has, has not made over the last 15 to 20 years. And this is crucial. If you look at production versus consumption over the last 30 years, production's declined 26%, but consumption's per, uh, increased by over 300%. Um, and this consumption is going to continue to increase. We need to be consuming more natural gas to produce electricity today. It's a tragedy that we're burning bunker fuel, high sulfur bunker fuel to generate electricity. Um, part of the reason is because the power generators don't have access to the natural gas that they would want. Uh, many of them are isolated from the natural gas grid, or they just can't physically buy the gas from the U.S. and be able to guarantee their supply. Our operating footprint is, as I mentioned, is spread across three states, um, with a lot of the activity, uh, earliest activity up in, the Tam in Tamaulipas. We're currently operating two drilling rigs. Uh, we've drilled nine wells, uh, the vast majority of which have been exploration. We're currently operating typically two coil tubing rigs. We have four or five civil projects going on at any one time. Um, we're currently in the process of permitting an additional 20 exploration wells. Uh, and we've started our development gas program in, in the Burgos Basin. Um, what we're also very proud of is we've created over 500 indirect jobs in, in, these, in these three states. Uh, we're working very hard to make sure that the suppliers from the communities as close as possible to where we're operating, uh, are providing services for us. If they're not up to the standard that we need, we work with them through an outreach program um, to be able to get them to the standard that we need. We're never willing to sacrifice uh, safety standards and training standards for the people that come to our locations, but we're willing to work with them. We're also very proud of the fact that over the last 18 months, we've figured out how to operate uh, through the COVID pandemic. We've applied more than 5,000 COVID tests. We filter every person that comes on and off our sites in our own facilities. We have very strong bio, um, biohazard standards. Uh, and as a result, we're very proud of the fact that we have not had any serious cases of COVID and we've had no fatalities in the company. 
Uh, this is something that we've worked very hard at. It's been a challenge. No one knew how to work this way before. Um, but some of the things that we've done have been, as an example, you'll see at that rig, uh, the photo of the rig site on the top right hand corner, we have a full living camp on the location, which is not normal in Mexico. Uh, we originally started thinking about this from a point of view of reducing exposure for people to security risks, keeping them off the roads, uh, which is actually you know, still our largest risk. But at the end of the day, it's helped us with COVID as well as because we can keep the crews on location for an extended period of time and minimize the rotation on and off the location. That's allowed us to, to reduce the exposure for COVID. This is not a trivial issue for us. Um, as many of you know, Pemex has had severe uh, problems with COVID and we share the supply community with Pemex. And as a result, we've had to work very hard. We often have cases where we've had multiple people have to be screened out and not able to attend the locations and have to quarantine crews for extended period of time. We do this all on our own dime to make sure that the suppliers are, are feeling like they're getting support. And we do this as part of our community outreach program as well, providing um, hygiene uh, materials to the communities where we operate, dispenses to areas that have been affected economically um, by the pandemic as well. And if you look at Jaguar's impact on an industry basis, there are 101 um, contracts on land other than, uh, sorry, 101 contracts other than Pemex that are active for private companies um, in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, we have 10 contracts, so we're just about 9%. Um, of the active plans that are in place, as many of you know, to do anything in Mexico, we have to have a plan that's been approved by the CNH. Um, of the 130 plans that are active outside of Pemex, we have 18% of them. But we have 21% of the seismic processing programs going on, 23% of the exploration wells that have been drilled in, on, in, in Mexico over the last, um, the last year and a half. We've had 17% of the discoveries. And I think more importantly, going forward, we're planning to drill almost the same number of exploration wells as the rest of the industry combined. Um, so we're very firmly committed to the idea that there's huge potential in the subsurface in Mexico. And that by going out and being bold and drilling these exploration wells, applying the best possible science, that we're going to be successful. One of the things we've also been looking at is creative ways to be able to get gas to market without having to spend time, energy, and potentially environmental impact to be able to, to deliver that gas to market. Uh, so we worked very closely with the CNH last year to be able to come up with the permitting and, and regulatory requirements for what's called a virtual pipeline. Uh, this is the first time this technology has ever been applied in Mexico to compress gas at the wellhead and sell by truck. Um, so the first stage of this project, you can see the photos here, we are compressing to CNG uh, and we are trucking the CNG directly to the end consumer. Um, why is this important? Most importantly, I think is if you have gas that's isolated, that maybe economically or from an environmental perspective, the cost to build the pipeline to connect it into the, in, uh, into the infrastructure regionally may be prohibitive, this allows you to commercialize uh, what we call stranded gas. Um, the next stage of this process is we're going to be bringing in larger compression equipment to be able to go all the way to LNG. Uh, and by going to LNG, the distance that we can economically truck the gas uh, to the end consumer increases and the options for the consumption of the gas increases. So we're going to continue to apply this technology and it's a way to unlock potential that had been left behind in the past without necessarily having to build a new pipeline. This is also going to be really crucial when we get into gas operations um, in some of the, the swampy areas in, uh, in Southeast Mexico, in Tabasco, because it will allow us to potentially commercialize the gas without having to build pipelines through mangrove swamps. And this is what we see for our future. Um, the, the production that we're in the, in the black part of the graph here is off our existing reserve base. These are the development programs we're working on today. Uh, we expect to more than triple our gas production by the end of the first quarter of next year uh, and going forward, looking to raise the production to something on the order of 70, 80 million cubic feet a day. But our true growth comes from exploration. So going out and, and boldly looking for, for new opportunities, new reservoirs and bringing those on stream. And our objective is to be able to address 7% of Mexico's natural gas demand, the total natural gas demand, including the gas that's currently coming from imported sources. This will have a huge value creation for the Mexican economy um, and will create something on the order of four to 5,000 uh, jobs in the, in the communities where we operate. So where we are today is uh, focused on our exploration, starting our development in the Burgos Basin, finding creative ways to be able to commercialize gas, not sticking to the idea that you have to ship a gas through a pipeline and trying to do it all properly, trying to do it all right. And where we're going forward is our objective is to be able to make clean 
and um, cost-effective natural gas available at a low cost to everybody in Mexico. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks a lot, Warren. Uh, the first question would be, how much investment do you estimate we would need to really make Mexico a gas producing hub? Um, I mean, our investment projections for ourselves are, are something on the order of four to five billion US, um, and that will address, say, 7% of the, of the Mexican market. The good thing is we, we forget, I think, that all of this infrastructure that exists that's importing gas from the US was originally designed to send Mexican gas into the US. So a lot of the large infrastructure investments have been done. The big regional pipelines are there. The gas processing facilities are there. Um, what needs to be done is really on the exploration side is going out and, and, and drilling a lot more wells, uh, understanding the geology much better. So, uh, you know, something on the order of 20 to 30 billion is probably the total investment that's required. Um, I think the bigger question is how do you make sure that that gas is accessible to everybody in Mexico and no, not only to the people that are in the large population hubs, um, I think that's something that we need to be working on collectively as an industry to find creative ways to get the gas into the communities that are currently literally burning wood or charcoal to be able to cook um, or, or having to deforest areas to be able to survive. And I think if we can find a way to creatively get a cost effective, cleaner burning fuel to those communities, we're going to make a huge impact in, in Mexico. Uh, the next question uh, from the audience is, do you think offshore gas production could become viable in the future? Definitely. In fact, there's a huge amount of offshore gas production today. Unfortunately, it's associated gas with, with uh, oil production. And most of it is either being vented or flared. Um, it's going to be cost costly to be able to go out and retrofit the platforms that are currently there to capture that gas and use it. But it's something that we should be looking at as an industry. Um, it's going to be very difficult for Pemex to be able to invest that money. Um, nobody knows for sure how much gas, well, I'm certain that people in Pemex that know how much of the gas is going into the atmosphere today. Um, but if you look at uh, the, the carbon footprint in Mexico, there are two huge sources of carbon footprint. One is the escaping of, na of natural gas. And almost all of that is coming from offshore activities where flaring is occurring, um, where the gas is not being used. Uh, and then the second source is power generation using high sulfur pump fuel. So we can fix those two problems, which will require investment. Um, the carbon footprint in Mexico is going to fundamentally uh, change for the better. We have a third question. Um, what would be the importance of storage in Mexico's potential to become a major natural gas producer? Well, when you look at um, countries that have been able to make natural gas the primary source of their, of their energy um, grid uh, and industrial supply grid, um, storage has been a key thing to be able to, to deal with any supply shocks. Um, I think as we go forward, what we're going to see is more creative solution with using LNG as the storage mechanism um, rather than conventional underground storage. There have been studies done in Mexico. There are formations that have the potential for storage, and it would be a good thing to make sure we avoid any supply shocks like for in, in, in February. Um, but I think the solution in Mexico, particularly given that a lot of the gas infrastructure actually gets to the coast, could be water-based LNG um, storage solutions um, to supplement some of the underground storage solutions that are being looked at uh, today by the government. So I think it's something that would be nice to have. It's important. Um, and it would avoid uh, another supply shock like we had in February. But I think the more important thing is to make sure that there's enough gas being produced in Mexico and enough value being created in Mexico that things like storage and making the investment will start to make sense. Because it doesn't make any sense to buy gas from the U.S. and then store it in Mexico uh, from an economic perspective. If we were producing the gas in Mexico and you could find creative ways to incentivize that the tax load on the gas being stored in Mexico was lower or something that allowed you to defer some of the costs associated with storing that gas, then it becomes a really attractive solution. Uh, someone else is asking, uh, my question relates to those natural gas well standard from access to the gas pipelines. Based on the solution implemented by Jaguar to extract the gas and process it as LNG, what would be the production uh, threshold for a well to become cost effective for this solution? So this, this technology was actually originally developed um, in, in Argentina and, and has been, and been applied fairly uh, broadly in, in two markets, in the U.S. and in Argentina. So the places that this has been used has been precisely where you don't have enough gas production to be able to justify a pipeline. Um, and it's been applied down to wells that are producing as low as half a million cubic feet a day. 
Um, so it's, it's technology that is very good at dealing with small gas production. Um, it used to be cost prohibitive to generate LNG if you didn't have a huge production size because the cost of the infrastructure was so, so huge. But a couple of companies have managed to miniaturize and modularize uh, the production. What's really exciting about the technology is if you bring the equipment in, you can drop it on location and literally be compressing and selling natural gas the next day. Um, so that the, the time effectiveness of being able to commercialize the gas. And a lot of these projects have been done where you have a, a group of 15 or 20 wells that are not depleted, not tied in, and you go and you deplete one well, and when that's done, you go to the next one, you just, you just keep going. Um, so it, it's actually particularly well suited for small production, um, which is really exciting because it's also, because of that, it can be very attractive for a small consumer that also can't justify tying into the regional pipeline grid but might would rather burn natural gas versus burning diesel uh, or consuming a huge amount of electricity. And as a result, you can do end-to-end -end solution. Uh, other than in the Northern part, are there other areas that look promising for gas production in Mexico? Yeah, we had a, we announced a discovery in March in the Tampico Misampa Basin, which is an area, uh, we have a, a block that's on the Golden Lane, which has historically been a huge oil producing area. Uh, we announced a, a sizable gas discovery there in, in, a, in some new geology that hadn't been drilled. There's potential in the Veracruz Basin. There's huge potential in, in the Veracruz and Tampico Masandla and in the southeast as well. So I think all around the Gulf of Mexico, all of the, the sedimentary basins have gas potential. It's a question of where you go in the basin to find that potential. Mm -hmm.